Okay, so our penultimate speaker of the evening, we have Emily Seward. Emily is a PhD student in her final year, in her words, whoop, and uh, she's studying the factors that drive changes in DNA. Uh, she previously spoke about you are what you eat, but something that people may not know about her is that she discovered a new species of parasite, hopefully not in the food that you were eating. And her next talk is going to be called How One Becomes Two, which thankfully is a talk on evolution and sorry, Jen, not math. Uh, so please welcome to the stage, Emily Seward. Men are from Mars and women are from Venus. When I first heard that as an adolescent, it made perfect sense to me because in my head, men were a different species. And what the, is being described, the scenario is one population going on to two different planets and no longer being able to interact. And that's the perfect setup for the evolution of one species into two different species, also known as speciation. But you don't have to have an interplanetary distance for speciation to occur. Other geographic barriers, like a, a tall mountain, a wide river, a deep ravine, anything that physically separates two populations for long enough can lead to speciation. But I think these examples are a little bit obvious. I mean. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that if you can't touch somebody, you can't mate with them. <laughs> I think the more interesting examples are where speciation occurs without a physical barrier getting in the way. But what sort of factors could drive that divergence from one until two? Well, it turns out that diet can play a role, at least if you're a fruit fly. And this was found out by looking at a population of flies and splitting it into two groups. The first group was fed on a diet of starch, and the second group was fed on a diet of maltose, which is a type of sugar. And what they found was that after just one generation, the starch-fed flies, which is a bit of a tongue twister, preferred to mate with other starch-fed flies, and the maltose-fed flies preferred to mate with other maltose-fed flies. And this persisted for several generations, the sort of scenario that you need for speciation to occur. But what's even more interesting was that it wasn't the diet itself that was responsible for the change in attractiveness of the flies. It was the bacteria on and in the flies that was responsible. So what was happening was the change in diet was changing the bacterial composition of the two groups, which was changing how they smelt, which was changing how attractive they were and how attracted they were to, other, to each other which I think is really cool because it's an example of speciation without physical barriers, without all the other things that you might have learned about already. And instead of the individuals being responsible, it's actually their bacterial communities that are driving the changes. So the next time you go on a date, perhaps don't worry so much about whether or not your star signs are aligned with one another and think more about whether or not your bacterial communities are compatible. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Emily. <laughs> Spend this round. So uh, what questions do we have then for Emily about her starch-fed flies and her maltose-fed flies? Well, I want it's to hear more about say. this. It's really hard to say. I want to hear more about this parasite that you discovered. Tell oh, us yeah. more. Oh, OK. So uh, it's a parasite called Phytomonas, and it's found inside insects. And I found it when I went to the Czech Republic. I was with an amazing group of scientists, one of whom was uh, somewhat eccentric. And the insects that harbor this parasite are found on a tree. And they're just clustered there over winter. There's like huge groups of them. And I thought, it's the perfect feeding ground for a bird, right? It should just come, have a load of bugs, fly away, have a great time. So I asked this guy, why, why don't the birds eat them? And he just went over to the tree. He picked one off. He put it in his mouth. He's like, oh, it doesn't taste very good, does it? <laughs> so it was, uh, yeah, it was a little parasite inside these insects. And it was, yeah, what, what more would you like to know other than it? <laughs> I could talk about it for quite a long time. It's got, it's one cell. It's very interesting. It's not very well studied. So when speciation events happen, then mm -hmm. the two species cannot mate with each other mm -hmm. right, anymore. It's not so much that they prefer not to, but they cannot. They might have a go, but it doesn't work in any, in terms of successful progeny, right? Yeah. So, so what drives that? Uh, it, well, it's a range of different things. So um, without going into too much gory detail, if the, this, okay, um, 
sometimes... No, please go into the gory detail. Sometimes bits don't fit together, and so that can stop you producing offspring. Um, in terms of the flies, there's actually a really interesting bacteria called, and I think I'm going to pronounce this wrong, Wolbachia. Oh, I said it right. Oh, good. Um, and what happens is if you've got two strains and they have different versions of this bacteria, this internal parasite, um, when those two strains meet, there's, it's like warfare. And essentially, there's a, a big fitness cost for the offspring so that they either die or they're not able to successfully um, reproduce. So there's a loads, of, loads of different reasons, but those were just my two favorites. So, Emily... You know, we look around, we're all pretty perfect, aren't we? <laughs> all right. Uh, you know, or, or, or are we? Will humans keep evolving, or have we reached some sort of pinnacle? This was a really interesting question. Um, so as I was preparing for this, I was looking at all the different forms of speciation, and one that came up was time separation. So it got me thinking that maybe all of like the early birds who get up and go for their runs and are super healthy, they're only ever going to meet other people who are active at that time. Whereas like the night owls are going to interact mainly with other night owls. And if this becomes heritable, maybe we're going to end up with a, a divide in the human race whereby you've got your, your larks and your owls and never the two shall meet. Maybe. Oh. Well, uh, thank you very much, Emily. Woo!